Hi, I'm Martin Swetman, and let's continue with part 19 of this series and look at paper 2 from Wolbach et al. So this is their second paper from 2018 that deals with uh, biomass burning. Now this paper is more ambitious, I think. Uh, the aim is to try and estimate the amount of biomass burned by the impact. And that's always going to be difficult because biomass burning or wildfires happen all the time. So somehow the authors need to find a way to discriminate between normal wildfires and those caused by the impact. Can they do it? Well, let's see. Their method is based on the data in these plots. So what we're looking at here are 10 Younger Dryas boundary sites where peaks in soot or charcoal are found in the soil and correlated at the same level with other impact indicators. And mainly that's platinum and uh, sometimes magnetic spherules in, in this particular case. Now, that in fact, their calculation for the amount of biomass burning caused by the impact only uses uh, these seven sites where peaks in what is known as AC soot or a cineform soot are found. And here's a picture uh, from the supplementary information of this type of soot taken by an electron microscope. And you can see the grape-like bunching of the carbon uh, particles that constitute this kind of soot. Now this type of soot they claim is evidence for high temperature wildfires uh, and the authors say it's only found at the Younger Dryas boundary and not above or below, uh, which is unlike charcoal uh, which is found everywhere. Now as you can see in each of these plots we don't have a complete profile of the entire sediment at each location. And I should point out that in these plots, the, the black lines represent either platinum or uh, magnetic spherules. And the, the sort of dotted lines represent the measurements for the asiniform soot or the AC soot. Now, reading through all the steps needed to make these uh, asiniform soot measurements, uh, there must be a lot of uncertainty in these results. It's a very laborious, painstaking process to isolate this specific type of soot and count it. And there's also a lot of variability in the, the measurements of the soot between these different sites. Some have much higher abundances of soot than others. And we need to keep in mind that these seven sites are just a very small sample of Earth's surface. And in fact, they're all from North America. And, and moreover, most of these sites, these seven sites where the uh, asiniform soot is measured, correspond to lake bed sediments or stream beds or canyons in which the soot would presumably have been concentrated because that's what lake streams and canyons do. They take water and sediment from a wide catchment area surrounding them. So by taking an average of the amount of soot from these kinds of sites, probably the authors are overestimating the average amount of soot across Earth's surface, and perhaps considerably overestimating it. The authors then assume that all the biomass burnt at this time by these uh, supposedly particularly intense wildfires uh, that went on to produce only the asiniform soot and not any other kind of charcoal or carbon dioxide, for example. So by converting the asiniform soot to biomass burned directly, they are probably underestimating the amount of biomass burned, probably quite considerably. And then when they, we follow the calculations through in this paper, they arrive at a figure of about 7% of the world's biomass was burned and turned into asiniform soot in these particularly hot fires. But this figure uses the current amount of biomass on Earth. So actually this corresponds to only about 3% of the biomass at the time of the impact. Well, whatever. Apparently this corresponds to about 5% of Earth's surface on fire all on the same day. Now that's 
an extraordinary figure and hard to imagine, 5% of Earth's land surface burned by especially hot fires in one day. A real vision of hell. But how do we know there's anything special about these wildfires that produced the aciniform soot? Perhaps these were just ordinary wildfires triggered only by perhaps a change in climate and have got nothing to do with an impact. And this has been an argument used by opponents of the impact theory. They have sometimes claimed either that there is no evidence of enhanced wildfires at the onset of the Younger Dryas period, or if there is an abundance of charcoal, for instance, uh, then they say that, well, they often say that they, it's likely caused simply by a change to a drier climate and not a cosmic impact. Their argument here is that a, a colder climate will also be drier and therefore more fires might be expected anyway. Well, to counter that argument, remember the Comet Research Group's calculation in this paper only used this particular aciniform soot, or AC soot, found at the Younger Dryas boundary. And they say that this type of soot is an unusual product of wildfires. Most of the burned carbon remaining after a wildfire is in the form of charcoal or other kinds of soot, or in fact, carbon dioxide. So that seems like it could be good evidence for a highly unusual kind of wildfire. But Wolbach et al. in this paper go further uh, to try and show the fires were highly unusual and unlikely to be the product of natural wildfires. And they do this by analysing what is known as the world's charcoal database. So this is a collection of measurements made by many different researchers from around the world of charcoal found in many different sites with a wide range of uh, radiocarbon ages. Uh, and what they do first is uh, they recalibrate all these very many charcoal records using the very latest IntCal13 radiocarbon calibration curve. And then they compare the frequency of spikes in the charcoal abundance at the onset of the Younger Dryas period with other known periods of sudden cooling across the last ice age. Remember when we look at the Greenland ice cores, we see there are many rapid uh, temperature fluctuations during the last ice age. And it's possible to compare the timing of these rapid changes in temperature with the frequency of charcoal abundances at the same time in this world charcoal database. And here is the result in their paper. So what we're looking at here this, on this axis is the so-called Z-score. And this Z-score is simply a measure of the frequency of fires or the frequency of charcoal peaks or spikes. And the higher the score, the more frequent the fires were. And to give you an idea of, of what this charcoal database um, looks like, uh, here are some plots of charcoal abundances from different lake sediments. And these are in the supplementary information of their paper. So for example, if we look at the uh, plot D here from one particular lake, we see that there are a lot of fluctuations in this region, and then perhaps slightly fewer here, and, and far fewer fluctuations before. So this region here would have a, a high Z score, this would have like a moderate Z score, and this region would have like a low Z score. So that's what this Z score is referring to. So anyway, back to their key result. It shows that there were a lot of fires around the time of the Younger Dryas cooling, the onset of the Younger Dryas episode, which is indicated by this uh, vertical dashed line here. And so there's a peak in the number of fires, or the fire frequency, at around this time, and then it's followed by a dip. And then it increases again at later times. And if we compare to other cooling events, the ones that I just showed you uh, from the Greenland ice cores, which are often called dansgaard Ushka events or Heinrich events, we see that there's an opposite trend that at the onset of these cooling events, we tend to get fewer fires. So the fact that we get more fires near the onset of the Younger Dryas period is taken as evidence that the, the, the fires at that time are unusual and they sort of buck the usual trend 
uh, just at the time of any other cooling event. So the argument that the Younger Dryas climate change by itself resulted in extra fires at the onset of the Younger Dryas mini ice age appears to be false. So this is really quite nice. And together with the unusual appearance of the asiniform soot, I think it's probably good evidence that there were, there were many impact generated wildfires at this time. Now moving on, in the rest of the paper they discuss the likely effects of the amount of soot and smoke produced by these wildfires if they all occurred on the same day. So the wildfires that, cor that correspond to the, the amount of asiniform soot measured at the Younger Dryas boundary. And they argue that this amount of soot and smoke would have resulted in an optical depth of around, well, somewhere from say 150 to 600. And as the amount of sunlight reaching the ground is exponentially related to this optical depth, then an optical depth of 600 is effectively complete darkness. The kind of total darkness you only normally experience inside a deep cave. So apparently the people, animals and plants after the impact event would have lived in complete darkness for around six weeks until the soot settled and the smoke cleared. And you can imagine the effects of this darkness. Many plants would have died because they need the sun for photosynthesis and most large grazers that depend on large amounts of fresh plant life would have starved. Many of their meat eating predators would have died too. And the darkness would have caused extreme cold too. So Earth's surface would have lost a lot of heat and cooled suddenly, and perhaps some oceans uh, would have frozen over, perhaps changing ocean circulation patterns and thereby the world's climate. So this is how Wolbach et al. explain the apparent die-off of many of the world's megafauna at this time. And it's a good story, you know, pitch black darkness for a period of six weeks would certainly have had a profound effect on flora and fauna. And there would no doubt have been many extinctions. And just think of the effect on humans. How would we have interpreted it, this darkness? Stories about the end of the world caused by flood and fire followed by its rebirth would no doubt be popular, just as we find in many religions. But as we've already seen, the amount of soot produced might have been significantly overestimated by Wolbach et al. So how confident can we be in this very high optical depth of between 150 and 600? If we go back to their initial plots from which they made this calculation, we see the measurements are highly variable. But what does seem to be the case is that the freshwater locations, places like Arlington Canyon, Blackville, Blackwater Draw, Bull Creek, Murray Springs, and so on, seem to have about 10 times as much a cineform soot in the Younger Dryas layer, boundary layer, as the dry locations, which are uh, Melrose and Newtonville. So Melrose is uh, an ancient glacial moraine, and Newtonville is an ancient dune field, which would presumably was fairly dry at the time, and they have roughly one-tenth of the average amount of soot. So let's suppose that their estimate for the amount of biomass burning is overestimated by a factor of 10. Uh, actually, it probably isn't overestimated by that much because a cineform soot would not have been the only form of burned carbon to remain after the event. But anyway, let's be skeptical and suppose they overestimated the biomass burning by a factor of 10. Well, that means the optical depth would have been between 15 and 60 and not 600. Now, an optical depth of 60 still corresponds to total darkness. And even an optical depth of 15 corresponds to near total darkness. So whichever way you look at it, they do seem to have a good case for the effects of biomass burning caused by the impact event on megafaunal extinctions. And of course, a freezing temperature would likely have contributed to the onset of the Younger Dryas Mini Ice Age. And they reinforce this view of sudden megafaunal extinctions uh, by again this, citing this review uh, by Vance Haynes, 
of the evidence from nearly a hundred sites across America, a uh, hundred black mat sites. So just to remind ourselves, uh, he says, this layer or mat covers the Clovis Age landscape or surface on which the last remnants of the terminal Pleistocene megafauna are recorded. Stratigraphically and chronologically, the extinction appears to have been catastrophic, seemingly too sudden and extensive for either human predation or climate change to have been the primary cause. So this all ties together. But what do the critics say? So let's now return to the response by Holiday et al. Uh, from, the, from 2000 to see what they think specifically of the claims in this second paper. Well, their very first statement on this evidence is quite astonishing, and here it is. They say, uh, evidence for a link between extraterrestrial impacts and wildfires is weak. Now, you don't need to be Einstein to know that this is nonsense. I mean, really, these guys are incredible. It's a no-brainer. Of course, cosmic impacts will cause extensive wildfires. And this is the general view among scientists for obvious reasons. And any evidence to the contrary should be examined very carefully because it's very likely flawed. And then a bit later on, they say, there is no clear evidence of any large fires connected to an impact at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, in large part because no impact site is known or has been unambiguously dated, unless the location of implied impact related wildfires is poorly defined. Well, again, this is appealing to the, the absence of a crater. And we know that this is a flawed argument. No crater is needed uh, by the Younger Dryas impact scenario. And even if there is one, uh, it's quite possible that it's remained hidden until now. So the absence of a crater, given all the other geochemical uh, evidence that we do have, the platinum, the impact spherules, and so on, uh, is really not a good argument. And then in the rest of their text, they tend to discuss the charcoal and not the aciniform soot that was measured and used specifically by Wolbach et al. So they have nothing to say about the aciniform soot, which is the basis of Wolbach et al.'s argument. And therefore, their calculation and their argument is unchallenged. But remember these plots of fire frequency based on charcoal abundances from the World Charcoal Database uh, that suggests that wildfires are uncommon in many earlier dramatic cooling episodes and therefore the increased fire frequency that is apparent near the Younger Dryas onset might be explained in terms of impact wildfires. So what do Holiday et al. have to say about this? Well, they point out that this increase in fire frequency, this peak here, actually correlates very well with this spike in climate recorded in the Greenland ice cores. So this peak in average temperatures begins just before the onset of the Younger Dryas. And it has a similar width to this peak that Wolbach et al. Uh, find in their data at this time. So Holiday et al. argue that this peak is actually related to this earlier uh, uh, spike in climate. Now I think they have a good point here. Wolbach et al.'s argument that this peak in fire frequency is related somehow to the Younger Dryas event doesn't actually stand up to scrutiny. But actually, that's okay. Remember, until now, some detractors of the impact theory have suggested that if there is an increase in charcoal near the Younger Dryas boundary, it's likely caused by the change to a much colder and drier climate. But that argument is not supported by this evidence, which consistently shows that increases in fire frequency correlate with increases in average temperature, not decreases. Which makes a lot of sense, right? Essentially, what this means is that a hotter climate seems to be more important for wildfires than a drier, colder climate. So the fact that there is an abundance of unusual aciniform soot at the base of the black mat does seem to be remarkable. The argument that this soot is related to wildfires induced by a colder, drier climate is still not supported by this evidence. 
And what about the possibility that extreme wildfires led to soot blocking out the sun, which in turn contributed to megafaunal extinctions? What do Holiday et al. have to say about this? Well, after making some opinionated comments about these megafaunal extinctions, they turn to some specific evidence that they claim contradicts the Younger Dryas impact theory. And especially they cite uh, Gill et al. from 2009 and Grayson from 2016. Now we previously reviewed Gill et al. from 2009, just a few videos ago, and found that it was flawed and that actually their results are fully consistent with the Younger Dryas impact theory. Their work examining ancient lake sediments was clearly biased and probably misinterpreted the data, which actually shows a fairly rapid die-off of megafauna after some kind of extreme event signalled by a charcoal-laden sediment layer and a sudden change of climate consistent with the Younger Dryas. We haven't actually previously reviewed this work by Grayson in 2016, but in any case, this is not a peer-reviewed reference. In fact, it's just a book. So we can't rely on that either. So in terms of actual peer-reviewed evidence that contradicts the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, they've got nothing. Indeed, Wolbach et al. provide more detailed responses to their arguments in their counter-response here. Now, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I'm just going to summarize at this point uh, the take-home message from Wolbach et al.'s second paper. So in my view, they've made a good first stab at making the case for an unusual burning event at the onset of the Younger Dryas, which might have produced so much smoke and soot that it created an impact winter effect, which in turn could have triggered the Younger Dryas climate event and would help to explain the apparent exceptional nature of megafaunal extinctions and human population changes at this time. But there are some problems with their work, uh, which means it's not totally convincing. For example, it would be better if there were more measurements of the aciniform soot to make it clear that there are real spikes in the abundance and that these are not mistaken. And it would be better if they had a much wider range of sample sites, just than the, the seven here, most of which correspond to freshwater collection locations. So this all means that there's clearly a lot of uncertainty in their estimates. But we have to realise that these measurements of the aciniform soot, this particular kind of soot, are very laborious. And it takes a lot of effort to isolate and count this specific type of soot. So I see this then as a good first attempt, which will hopefully be expanded and improved on in later studies. It certainly makes a lot of sense in the context of the impact theory. OK, that's enough for now. We, we've nearly finished now, and I'll try to wrap up this review of the Younger Dryas bibliography in the next few videos. And you can find out more about the Younger Dryas impact from my book and my blog, as well as other videos on my channel here.